Thank you for joining us for this session and for the next hour um, as we talk about transatlantic cooperativism. I'm Johnny Gordon Farley. I'm the editor of our magazine and the programme designer of the New Economy Programme, which is our democratic learning and action platform. And Salgars Mill, as I've just mentioned, our residential training centre in the southwest of England. This is the first of a planned series of events on transatlantic cooperativism that we're launching today at the festival. So we plan to have one in December and then every quarter from there on. And so why a session on Anglo and American co-op movements? So personally, in Stir to Action, I've been building relationships um, with our US colleagues through publishing, uh, conferences and on online events over the last five years, uh, mainly starting back in 2016 when we attended the Platform Co-op Festival um, conference at the New School in New York. Um, but we've also been working with Jessica gordon Nemhard, who joins us for a session later around her work on African-American co-op economics. More recently, Mary Bautista, who's been doing work on worker co-op development in immigrant communities in Brooklyn, New York. Um, and more recently starting to follow the work of Esther Van Kelly in the US Federation of Co-ops. Um, and despite the US having a kind of relatively small worker co-op sector, we've been inspired in many other ways from their work to center racial justice, immigrant development, and the role of co-ops within community economic development. And obviously not trying to paint the US as perfect. I'm sure a few of those things will be flushed out today, but it felt like a, a good conversation to have that's been building over the last few years. And we wanted to create a more formal space for this conversation that could kind of continue um, over the next couple of years. So really excited to introduce the panel. Um, we've got Nathan Schneider, who's a US journalist and author who covers social movements in the United States. First read Nathan um, reporting on Occupy um, back in yeah 2010. Um, he's the professor of media studies at the University of Colorado Boulder. And yesterday he launched Exit to Community, which I'm sure he'll talk about today, but congrats for launching that. We've got Esteban Kelly, who's the Executive Director of the US Federation of Worker Co-ops. He served on many different boards, including the US Solidarity Economy Network and the National Co-op Business Association. And Kath Muller is involved in several worker co-ops in the UK from Radical Roots, which is a worker co-op and housing network and the Worker Co-op Council. We're going to first hear from the panel um, and then we'll open up for a Q&A. If you could drop questions into the chat box, um, we can pick those up as we go. Um, but yeah, we haven't um, decided on order, uh, but I thought I'd start with how I've spread out the bio. So if we could go Nathan, Esteban and finish with Kath, that'd be great. So thanks for joining us and over to Nathan. All right. Well, um... Yeah, I'm not sure exactly what would be the most useful way to start, but um, uh, but I can try. And I can, you know, first of all, uh, emphasize the importance of these cross-oceanic, cross-continental um, in the, um, the early recognition, at least for me personally, of the rise of something that came to uh, by uh, my Herbert Schultz uh, uh, platform cooperativism uh, in moving between the U.S. and Europe, uh, seeing, for instance, social movement in the U.S. in places like Occupy Wall Street camps and um, and, and the like, uh, uh, with the that people were using, controlling and not owning, um, and the rise of the sharing economy and the gig economy and related kind of um uh, uh bits of jar uh and then coming to europe and the uk during that time trying to think through what was going on and starting to see um some manifestations of people trying to figure out how to build uh a tech that was owned and governed by people that and first i think is that the the europe and the uk brought into that conversation, um, particularly a kind of openness to uh, a broader range of financing options. It, venture capital isn't always the only game in town. Uh, certain logics around, um, you know, ideas of, of social innovation and, you know, certain ideas and bits of jargon that we don't use over here um, that 
uh, created space for thinking about co-owning our technology in ways. Uh, a certain history, um, a history of, of um, interactions between unions and public and so forth that, that you know, open the door to some of these conversations in ways that, you know, in ways that we didn't see. Um, and, um, and, and this conversation emerged uh, uh, across continentally all along. And, um, uh, you know, that, and that's continuing very much in the context of uh, the work I've been doing now. This exit to community idea you mentioned, um, Johnny, is, is really just like a kind of continuation of this work of trying to uh, create pathways for democratic ownership and governance uh, in our line economies. And, and uh, what it targets is this particular um, idea of the exit. And if you stop a random person on the street um, and you say, you know, uh, we're, we're, we're working on exits, um, you know, they might look at you and what do you mean? Um, is there a fire in the building? Should I exit? You know, there's all sorts of, of responses one might have. But if you stop the street in Silicon Valley or on the on something and you said you're doing something about exits, they would um, give you a look of recognition and say, tell me more, um, uh, because that exit is the kind of crucial moment in the life of a startup uh, that where it transitions from being a organization know what it's for, uh, but is trying to figure that out and might have a lot of money to do that based on some sort of investment scheme um, uh, to a situation where it becomes kind of a, uh, the own controlled subsidiary of capitalism uh, in, a, in a, a, a final way, either through becoming a public company on stock markets and uh, or or being acquired by a bigger company. And Community is just a story that if, what if exits were um, involved something else, community ownership as the destination for startups. Um, and so recognize that maybe not every um, co-owned platform, co-owned company is something that begins as a cooperative or the like, um, but maybe it finds its way there. Maybe this is a destination. Uh, that we work for. And, and this is also something that draws of uh, long history um, worker ownership conversions uh, that, you know, in the UK has its history of, of, exp of actually incentivizing with public policy, these kinds of conversions uh, we draw on in Latin America and, um, uh, and a range of Italy, uh, as well as some cases in the US. Um, and, um, and, and through this, we, you know, we know that it is possible to see this as a kind of destination, uh, but uh, the available is it, how easy is it? Uh, so what this whole exit to community, our, our new little um, uh, uh, booklet, pamphlet, zine-ish thing um, uh, explores, uh, which we released yesterday and it's, it's available uh, now for free uh, in print and, and online. Um, is, you know, what kinds of tools could we use to make this kind of thing worker, uh, something like a worker ownership conversion, but maybe so for users, stakeholders, more available in the course of activity in the online economy. So that's the challenge we're, we're working with now. Okay. Thank you, Nathan. We pass over to Esteban. Sure. Um, first of all, thanks so much for inviting me here. Um, I've been excited about us being increasingly um, in contact with each other, um, not just between the UK and the US, but uh, but in this international space. It's 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 part of what fuels um, our momentum and our inspiration and our organizing. But but also, I think a lot of the ideas and the strategies like that cross-pollination is how we've been able to not just unlock um, new approaches to cooperative development, but also to accelerate the organizing that we have been doing. So um, thank you for that. And I'm, I'm excited 
to be in conversation about some of these things. I actually wanted to start with one of the last things that Nathan was just saying. And <laughs> Nathan, good to see you. I, I imagine it's it's even earlier for you than it is for me. And I'm not a morning person, my friend. Um, so, um, so thanks for being here. Yeah, that that question about how easy is it, right? So we there's all this stuff that we understand as movement organizers or um, folks who do technical assistance or um, who are involved in cooperatives in different ways. But this question of how do we facilitate or how do we even do the scan and, and, and the assessment uh, and the diagnostics of the existing state of the sector and infrastructure to be able to have a sense of how how hard is it? I mean, it's both how easy is it and how hard is it? Um, and what does it take for people to um, either discover worker ownership or know about it or be excited about it and make that, that incredibly arduous leap from um, wanting to pursue workplace democracy and having an up and running cooperative um, democratic workplace. Um, and, you know, I, I'm saying that not in a hypothetical, but it's very much in the context of the U.S., which has been, uh, I mean, still fairly small, but we've been growing at a pretty rapid pace. We also have not been shrinking. Um, and that is, I mean, we're still waiting to see how the how the data shakes out um, as we've been in touch with our, our members throughout the year um, in the in the aftermath of the pandemic. But uh, or rather, we're still in the pandemic, but that the immediate hit economically for some of those businesses. Um, by all accounts, I've only heard of one worker co-op so far closing um, in the U.S. through all of this, closing permanently. Um, so, yeah, we think about this in a couple of ways. You know, we're, we're part of a rapidly growing sector, um, even our own federation, our own organizing um, is growing if anything, it's kind of growing at a faster pace than uh, than co-ops are developing themselves. Although sometimes that's hard to know because it's not uh, a very centralized um, ecosystem, right? You don't register with um, the Bureau of whatever in France or the Department of such and such in Italy. Um, you just kind of go and do a thing and hopefully we discover you or you've reached out to somebody in our vast network to get the support you need um, in order to become a cooperative. So, um, yeah, I mean, generally we see to, to distill it two different models or pathways toward accelerating that growth. I mean, one is this, uh, I think what most people think of for, uh, when they think about cooperative development, which is um, very entrepreneurial, right? Usually a startup um, or some sort of like, we're already doing this thing as freelancers, let's kind of convert it into being a co-op of some sort. The other is taking businesses that are already up and running as businesses um and uh and yeah and converting them into worker ownership and so it's a different set of technical assistant and the assistance that they that it demands and the question of how how easy is it for an entrepreneur to f form and launch their business as a cooperative which is often going to be a very small business if it's if it's an entrepreneurial path versus um an existing business how easy is it for them to transition and convert and become uh, a worker co-op so a lot of what we've done, especially in the last decade, but certainly in the years leading up to that, the Federation, the Worker Co-op Federation is about um, 16, we just turned 16 years old this year, um, was filling in all of those gaps in the ecosystem to facilitate, to exactly toward Nathan's point, to facilitate cooperative growth, cooperative organizing, and also to make sure that the existing businesses are thriving, which is really our mandate as a grassroots you know, membership trade association. Um, and while we're doing it, I think the important thing for us is that we're doing it in a way that reaches new audiences, that um, allows for cultural pluralism, and, and not just for people to feel um, like maybe there's a way for them to be included, or like maybe we're a diverse um, uh, network, which certainly we are, but actually to feel ownership of it, to feel leadership of it. Um, and so the more that, I don't know, a majority of our board are... Um, bilingual English and Spanish speakers. Um, uh, most of our staff are people of color. And I think that that ends up mattering for 
um, being liaisons and representatives in the community with some of the community-based organizations that are involved in worker co-op development and expansion, um, like evangelizing the model, but also just to be able to provide orientation, education, training, technical assistance in a culturally competent um, and, and uh, culturally relevant sort of pedagogically um, modality that, that reaches those audiences. Um, so that's, I think, a lot of what undergirds some of our successes in that work. Um, and then I think the newer pieces where it starts to dovetail with, with Nathan's work are really around um, not so much this uh, converting existing business or, or uh, supporting startups, but actually thinking about it more in terms of workplace organizing, the way that labor um, uh, organizers uh, do, do their work, which is taking existing workforces, people who are like very dissatisfied with their conditions, um, which, you know, no surprise under late capitalist neoliberal um, conditions, their benefits are being cut, their hours are being expanded, their take home wages are suppressed, their, you know, their health is going um, down, the, down the tube, all of that stuff, right? And so we're able to take um, dissatisfied and alienated workers, whether they're journalists, whether they're um, in the gig economy, and um, starting to think about ways to, um, to, to take those groups um, and organize them into cooperative businesses that then can be contracted within a value chain um, or within some sort of logistics chain. Um, and frankly, that fits that in a lot of ways, that's a, that's a great opportunity for expanding worker ownership, precisely because both the state and a lot of corporations are trying to outsource, shrink, downsize, contract, subcontract, rather than take on employees and be responsible for all of those things. So, um, I think those are just some from top of top of mind. Some of the things um, that I wanted to 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 share as updates, as a the the context for um, a lot of our growth and strategy. Happy to say more in discussion. Yeah, cool. Thank you, Esteban. Lots to lots to come back to there. So mm -hmm. to come across or come back to or whatever it is back to the UK. Um, yeah, over to you, Kath. Oh yeah, sorry. I I, uh, I get really distracted by my face while I'm listening to other people. So, um, I guess Johnny kind of stole my thunder a little bit about how I was gonna talk about what what do we even mean by transatlantic co cooperativism. So, um, I was thinking about what what is what is really the the point of being in touch with each other, and it kind of seems obvious, but it's worth asking the question. Um, I kind of wanted to compare the UK and the US worker co-op movements. It seems to me that the the US movement, um, I mean, Esteban talked about um, the Federation kind of put potentially growing faster than there are actually worker co-ops being developed. Is that, did I understand that right? Um, but certainly uh, when I went over the, there was just so much going on that the, the federation and the kind of the network, the the support network in the worker cop movement is seems very well resourced um, compared to what we have in the UK. And I feel like <laughs> you're laughing, but maybe you just don't know how it is here. Um, I mean, we have in terms of actually employed people in the worker cop movement, we've got one part time member of staff at Coops UK um, and a project worker on a uh, kind of um, conversion. So. Yeah, it's a really, really different scene. And the really exciting thing that I think has happened, uh, not just during COVID, but but with the rise of platform co-ops um, and, and just the digital space is that despite the fact that we are kind of trying to do everything bootstrapping and through activists rather than through paid staff so much, although I think Stir to Action is really filling the gap there. Um, is that there is all this stuff coming out from from the federation and, and the rest of the movement in the states um, and Canada, which which we can use and and we can point people to, and that's just incredibly useful, so useful, um, and not just the resources that are coming out, which I mean, you know, clearly there's legal structures that are not, not legal contexts that are not the same, and maybe we won't have the same lenders. Um, but in terms of the kind of philosophical basis, we have a lot more in common, not just English language, but we have a lot more in common 
um, with the North Americans than we do with kind of culturally with the Spanish or the French or the Italians. Um, and their resources like, uh, so just do this in your neighborhood and you look out your, your door and you're like, I don't think my neighborhood's going to go for that. Whereas, you know, the stuff that's coming out of the States is just far more relevant. Um, and also, um, and you referred to the stuff around uh, the work you're doing on race and class, which I think is just we we haven't we we don't know where to start it seems to me like and again so to action kind of taking the lead um and it's again been really useful so I, in in my neighborhood uh we had a uh, Kali Akuna and, and Saki Hall come over from Corporation Jackson and it just seemed to me like an absolute breath of fresh air to be able to say to uh people from African Caribbean um backgrounds in in where I live like hey look <laughs> black people can do co-ops and it just seems this thing that just isn't isn't really in the in the site guys certainly in the north of England in London I think maybe it's a bit different in Manchester a bit different but um it's not really in the cooperative movement site guys in the UK at all so we're really needing that input from the states um the other side of things I was going to yes yeah, so it's not just resources it's also um community so we've we've got digital spaces now where it's becoming more normal that you have people from all over the world taking part in various events this is one example but at the worker court weekend in the UK we had people over from North America and uh well Argentina as well um and then there's also infrastructural things. So, for example, social.coop, the, the Mastodon instance, which is like Twitter, which is just like a little cooperative kind of social fediverse uh, or whatever it's called. <laughs> um, and there's uh, meet.coop being set up. So the alternative to Zoom, which is cooperatively owned. And again, it's people between Canada and the States and the UK and various places. Um, and then things like Open Collective as well, um, creating a financial infrastructure for um, kind of startups and 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 people who need to do banking but don't yet have a bank account um, for their for their collective projects. All of these, and there's loads more, like a snowballing almost of this of this cooperative infrastructure that's um, global um, in its um, reach, but particularly uh, kind of english-speaking world um i think is is creating a lot of links for the english-speaking english-speaking world um yeah i'm going to stop there because i i have beginnings of questions thinking sort of spinning in my head but i, I want to see what the rest of the participants have to say cool thank you so much kath and to the rest of the panel um yeah lots lots to think on there um there's a couple of questions coming into the chat um I think just one quick question I wanted to jump in and that's been a piece of research that I'm just starting at the moment is around something that Mark, who's on the call today, um, is working on through Barefoot, which is training existing members of co-ops to kind of upskill them around co-op development, giving business advice is one way of building um, the advice capacity within the UK. Um, that's one example and it looks like it's the start of something great and it will inspire more. But looking across to the states, looking across to like Cooperation Works, which have got a co-op development program, Jamila Medley, Philadelphia Co-op Alliance, which have got a co-op development program up to Canada. Um, there seems to be quite a few programs that are training new generations of co-op developers. Um, and it's not something we're not thinking about in the UK and it's not something we're not working on, but it is something kind of looking across. There seems to be more of that infrastructure there. I just wonder if Esteban or Nathan could kind of speak to that sense. Is 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 that accurate or not? Or, you know, kind of representation of how, the yeah, there's work to build that infrastructure, bringing in new advisors um, into the sector to support, you know, new appetite, new interest in, in setting up co-ops. Do you want to go first, Nathan? Or do you, do you have something on the your side? Okay. So, yeah, I mean, and it well, I'm gonna I'm gonna actually tie it to something that Kath was saying about um, the 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 scale um, of our organized our national organized sector um, and and how that actually connects with some of the grassroots stuff um, that you were just talking about, Johnny. Which is, 
I just want to be real. When we were founded 16 years ago, um, and there was no organization happening, there was no organizing um, to to like connect the dots to really support um, in a strategic way the growth of the movement. There was organizing in the sense of like a bunch of cooperatives that were clustered around parts of the Pacific Northwest um, in Oregon and Washington State near Seattle. Um, or in the Bay Area out in California would get together. Um, but there there really was not a strategy about, hey, how are we building this? And what do we have to learn from, um, from especially models overseas where every other part of the world has an organized national association or federation for worker cooperatives and we don't, so what's up? When we started, we had one part-time staffer um, our founding executive director. Um, and that was it. In fact, in order to build out a full-time position, she took a job at a worker co-op just to like have a full-time full -time employment um, and, and access to some benefits. I mean, that's how we started. There was no um, infusion of, there was no massive grant in the beginning. Um, there was a little bit of some solidarity from the, the other not from the worker ownership sector, but from the other cooperatives who said, oh, you guys are finally growing up and getting your act together. Uh, do you wanna set up a headquarters in Washington DC and be um, under under the thumb of the, the National Cooperative Business Association, um, uh, which no shade on them, I'm actually a board member, I'm on the executive committee, we're, we're, great, we're great friends. Um, but you know, we politely declined and said, actually, we think we need to do this ourselves. If you have money, that would be helpful. But otherwise, we got to do this ourselves. Um, and by the time I was hired five years ago, um, two major things had shifted. One is that we had spun off a, a sister nonprofit organization who was sort of dually charged with um, helping to, to, to build scale and capacity um, uh, for the sector itself and, and to resource cooperatives. So organizing around financing, capital, a little bit of advocacy, certainly capturing philanthropic grants um, and mm -hmm. using some of that in order to help us grow. Um, and you know, there are deeper conversations we could have about how that strategy played out initially. We've started correcting for that and, and working more in, in tandem as we should have been all along to great effect. So I, I started five years ago, there were two of us um, on staff in um, for the or just our side at the Worker Co-op Federation. And we now have 10 people. Um, again, there was no moment where someone dropped a massive grant on us. I mean, I just had to roll up my sleeves. And a lot of what was different was not just this approach around, um, you know, taking seriously the importance of racial and economic justice, um, which which was codified when when our members created a grassroots member council within our federation uh, about three years ago called the Racial and Economic Justice Council. But, um, but that actually enough of our leaders entered into cooperative organizing. I don't use the term movement because to me, that's not what a movement, we're nowhere near what a movement is, um, but entered into that from actual movements, from grassroots movements, from some of them were involved in Occupy movements, especially Occupy Sandy. Uh, some of our leadership in New York um, after the the Hurricane Superstorm Sandy, there a lot of people who've been doing immigrant um, immigrant rights, uh, immigrant justice, immigrant organizing movements, um, some labor movements, right? And so I think that's where the shift came from. It was not that people were cooperators learning on the job about how to orient toward uh, community organizing. Uh, uh, a bigger politics uh, and and even rhetorically, like how to make that case, whether it's to policymakers or to uh, coalitions of of uh, folks who who should be in this movement with us, um, or even just to to co-sign in solidarity with climate justice movements, with housing rights movements, with you know cancel rent movements, whatever. Um, but that that was our background the whole time before we entered, and then we showed up in this space and we were like, oh, these white people need to be organized. Right, like that, there were there already was an existing um, uh, sector and, and network, and it it wasn't really informed. In fact, part of the organizing that I did, uh, even before I was on staff and I was a board member, was I started calling people 
not calling them out, but like inviting them into, I was like, I know you in real life and I know that your politics are not, why are you showing up in this, in this work as if you're just a nonprofit, like a buttoned up white nonprofit lady? Like, I know that you're, you, you, you're holding signs in the street on the weekend precisely around owning the means of production and all of these more radical politics. And hello, that's what we're doing. So let's, let's connect the dots internally. Let's lift up those leaders and make sure that, that they're appreciating that uh, bringing their talents and their networks and their politics to this organizing um, is actually worth their time. And I think that was the shift that for so long it was like, yo, these white people don't have their act together. They're acting just like all the other nonprofits. And so like, yeah, this is my job or these things are important. But everyone was sitting on their hands and waiting for somebody else to take the first move to say this. We can clean out space and make it a pro an appropriate place um, to be real about our politics and to articulate the ways in which it's liberatory. Um, and I think once we were able to unlock that, a lot of things changed. Thank, thank you for that. And I'm just wondering if Kath can kind of follow up on that in terms of outlining the kind of UK landscape in terms of how it works here. So I think there was an announcement at maybe today that the co-op group were going to pull funding from or some funding from co-op news, um, the co-op college and co-op UK. I don't know all the details about that, but again, it's a bit of a move from a big historical organization that's funded through a lot of these organizations that we see in the UK landscape and it's it's going to change things it's going to be disruptive um but could you talk about you know Esteban's talking about that kind of the independent development of their federation outside of DC which is our Manchester right you know what can you see in the next few years that might help to create new spaces and new positions which might then open us up to new audiences and take on more radical positions and of course talk about how radical roots already does that yeah, so it's, it's interesting actually that you're talking about bringing people in from the social justice movement because because uh, Radical Roots really is a it's a it's a federation of uh, radical cooperatives, but very largely housing co-ops, really almost entirely housing co-ops. And um, it didn't start that way. It started as workers co-ops, and it started in the '80s when there was a big worker co-op. Um, organization uh, infrastructure organization the industrial common ownership movement and then as uh, as uh, icom um kind of slowly faded because of um i guess the fizzling out of worker co-ops i don't can't quite remember what happened around the the end of the 80s and the 90s but icom's kind of basically had this loads of training it was providing loads of resources and it had more staff and required more money than the dwindling number of members could support and eventually it folded in around 2000 with the um consumer movement um the the cooperative union and became cooperatives uk and since that time we have not had our own organization and to some degree um it's possible that um the reduction in funding from um, the co-op group, which is the by far the largest member, uh, it's a retail cooperative society, so a retail consumer society, it's by far the largest member of Co-ops UK. And as Johnny mentioned, it, um, it, it provides a large amount of the sort of money that loads of the co-op organisations, infrastructure organisations rely on in this country. And that's been uh, seen for a long time as a weakness for the rest of us. Um, and we started about five years ago, started the uh, worker co-op weekends happening. Finally, that had been it had been 15 years since the worker co-op worker co-ops had got together in any form, really. And uh, and that the first one we started the worker co-op solidarity fund. So that's um, uh, open to individuals all putting in a pound a week. Um, and it does not it's not a formal organization. It's just uh, it's basically a Lumio group. Um, and uh, we have our money hosted somewhere and people can say, hey, I think we should spend money on this, this or this. And then, you know, you have a kind of discussion and people vote. So, yes or no, that's it. That's the extent of it. But because it's growing at 500, 500 pounds a week, more than 500 pounds a week, we've got, I don't know, like 50,000 or some, some ridiculous amount of money that we could spend. And that was when it was set up, it was seen as potentially the way that we can kind of eventually move out from kind of under the the control of Co-ops UK or the dependency on Co-ops UK. 
but it's still not a big amount of money and we do like we do have to take ourselves seriously um and get you know get into those big bits of money and the, and and having um people who can work full time on developing worker cooperatives because we don't have that um and it and it may well be that there's of um growth i guess partly from yeah the loss of that funding but also partly from uh the the kind of rise in uh, the mutual aid um groups that popped up around covid now not many of them have stayed as mutual aid groups but some have and some are working towards kind of cooperative identities and doing exciting things in their neighborhoods and there's just a huge rush of energy in those places it's amazing and and working out a way to bring those on board i think is is really crucially important um yeah there's loads of stuff going on in the in the chat that i'm <laughs> i'm not looking at at all um the, the other thing i'm going to say about, about roots, I suppose, um, is absolutely <laughs> it was yeah it was absolutely lost when covid hit we we have face to face meetings and uh <laughs> when covid hit we suddenly like didn't know what to do it was it was astonishing that we were so badly connected digitally um and also that we absolutely relied on people coming to our four times a year gatherings to participate in our in our um democratic uh structures so we like hilariously we had trouble with like trans irish sea corporation let alone transatlantic corporation um but that is starting to change now and i think um yeah the whole landscape of who who's going to find cooperatives accessible completely changes with covid um and with the the move to the sort of the more sudden move to digital uh and that's an interesting it's got some questions around it hasn't it like who's who finds it more accessible and who finds it less accessible yeah, there are so many questions in this in the chat here. Um, I mean, Chris has made a point that you know the UK is focused on its history and the heritage, and is being backward looking in terms of that. And he makes the point that um, it's been forgetting the kind of migrants that came to the UK and set up co-ops. There's a link to um, Wikipedia there about credit unions set up in London, um, which is really worth looking at. Have you seen anything, Esteban? In terms of the conversation with Simon here, yeah. Uh, well, yeah. so I think that solving this well, question of and, a bit of an echo. Oh, sorry, it's me. Yeah. <laughs> um, solving this question of right, I think I think we've been mentored is another way of thinking about it. Like that, all of the established cooperative um and these are a lot most of them are people that like i love and respect and have mentored me right into the space and and sort of demystified what is cooperative organizing uh how does the ica work what about all this international stuff ccopa etc cetera, etc cetera. like i only know about co-ops uk because of those white people <laughs> from from a different generation right and i think that it was it was important along the whole way that um i didn't i didn't take the wisdom from their mentorship um, without questioning it um, and questioning uh, the strategy and, and developing my own strategies uh, for thinking about, you know, what is possible. I mean, I, this is my own weird thing. I'm, I'm kind of a futurist. Um, and so I, I like, I actually struggle to live in the present because I'm so uh, forward looking um, and not like six months. I, you know, I'm, I'm thinking I'm like in like 20, 30 year, 40 year horizons. Um, and um, and so I yeah like I always saw the potential and and part of it was having a perspective or like a foot in both kind of uh, pools where I came out of youth organizing uh, as a teenager and a lot of like anarchist movements and food not bomb stuff and anti corporate globalization um, stuff and some some early climate stuff in the nineties um, and was hearing whether in study groups or literally on the streets at, at, at massive demonstrations, these calls for a particular vision of democracy and, um, and economic justice and, uh, and ways of, of reining in the size and the damage of corporations. And then I moved into a housing cooperative that happened to be uh, also a worker cooperative. I mean, we we ran a, a warehouse 
uh, I've told Kath this story um, probably a million times because we've had the pleasure of talking about it. But we really, I mean, we were doing joint purchasing. My first job there was driving a truck around and doing food delivery delivery to our 23 properties. I mean, this was not just like a residential hall. This was like really, we were cooking industrial meals. We had a past kitchen inspections. It was like a full, um, full set of businesses that were sort of inter um, meshed with each other. And so I'm seeing the proof of concept the example that demonstrated like, this is what this stuff looks like in practice. And this this particular cooperative had been around since the 1930s, talking about old roots, and had, uh, you know, billions upon millions of dollars of capital and assets, and assets. echoing again from John. Um, um, and so like connecting those dots and saying like, why aren't these people over here talking to these people over here when it's exactly, these things should ought to be going hand in hand. And so I think, you know, part of if, if you want to hear it as advice, my advice to organizers um, in the UK and, and overseas elsewhere, and, and even this is stuff I have to say on repeat within the US context, is just to like stop thinking in a silo that like cooperatives are their own thing and like that's your industry of expertise. It's like, no, co-ops are a model. And if they're as great as we say they are and as promising for solving all these solutions around uh, you know, migrant and refugee issues, um, uh, the future of work, digitization, precarious labor, like all of these different sustainable businesses, all of these problems, then surely we these movements should be uh, linked together and we should be able to deliver those models to other places instead of thinking about it from like, well, this is what we have and how do we grow it? It's like, here's a model and how how do we make sure that it's replicated, that it can scale? Doesn't We're not waiting on you to become an expert in you know the Caribbean diaspora. You're not gonna be effective at that, right? But how do you build the right allies and share the models and examples and tools with the communities who have the most to, to benefit from it? And then use your power of, of having insider status to unlock capital, wealth, investment from the white institutions and be the validator because I guarantee you those immigrant communities are not going to be having people writing those checks that they need because um, there is a fair amount of upfront costs in, in cooperative development, obviously. This, this is, uh, you're pointing to something I think really important, which is, which is, you know, I, I think goes to the, what we mean by cooperative. And I keep, I keep being stuck line. Um, Albert McKnight, who was a, a Catholic priest and leader in developing Black-led co-ops and uh, uh, in uh, in the American South, uh, and was a Pan-Africanist and and much more. And he he wrote in his kind of scattered, beautiful autobiography, "What we need to do is reinvent the cooperative idea. Um, ever the cooperative approach was needed, it is today, but it's still a disgrace to Black folks. That, folks, he said, that no place in this country do Blacks." control economically and you know it, and throughout this he is challenging the co-op movement to be more than itself right and and to recognize that maybe we in the co-op idea or some understanding of it some Rochdale principles or something like that that we're not we're not actually solving the problems we need to solve we're not targeting the problems we need to solve um, that we maybe we need to rethink some of these models, rethinking things like, for instance, what do we mean by open membership? You know, once I, I was talking to one of the the um, you know of an international cooperative alliance, you know, saying, you know, a lot of the people I work with and um, racial justice uh, issues and and uh, you know working in movements, they understand open membership is anti oppressive membership. And he said, well, that's not what the principles mean, <laughs> you know, and, and, you know, I think there's a need for listening to why are people building co-ops today? What are people seeing? What sci-fi visions are people seeing in the cooperative movement that actually might not be in the historical cooperative movement sometimes to start reinscribing and reinterpreting, rethinking what this movement is for, what this, what this model is for and put that first. Um, and and be careful about the kind of self-imposed limitations that that um, you know our past understanding would be and and you know part of that too is is um, like reparations which are critical for descendants of slaves uh, uh, for for uh, indigenous people who've been dispossessed um, they have they, they, there are um, it, as the 
cooperative model is understood today, often it's not equipped for those kinds of challenges, but there are certain pieces of it that could be. There are certain pieces of it that could be moved in that direction. When I raise issues of reparations in co-op spaces, what I often hear back is, oh, I don't know what co-ops could do for reparations. I, it, that's different. That's something you know the government has to do. And my question is, how can we rethink the co-op so that it can you know, be part of, a, of this broader effort? Um, and so, you know, it, 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 for instance, to, uh, you know, re reading an, an account of cooperative movement means perspective of, of uh, indigenous Americans, right? Who, who, when they see the cooperative model, they, and, and everyone says this started in Rochdale, right? Um, they see, you know, they see a colonial imposition that's claiming practices as foreign that they know very, intimately that are part of their communities. Um, and so uh, uh, through that experience to decolonize the cooperative idea, um, to decenter the, um, uh, the centers that we've, that we've uh, established, whether it's the NCBA or Manchester or whatever it is. Uh, but there, you know, you know we, we need to open ourselves to that, uh, to that. Cool. I really didn't want to jump in because, yeah, the conversation's taken a really fascinating um, direction there. Thank you, Nathan. Um, we've got five minutes left. Um, there's been some conversation in the chat about unions. Um, not necessarily to speak to the kind of union cult model necessarily, but it would be interesting to hear about the US relationship to unions if that's developed. Um, and if Kath might be able to speak to the UK situation, any work there. I mean, to say somebody's put a link in because um, there was a new manifesto released in partnership um, from, well, from the Co-op Union. Um, that was maybe five, six weeks ago now. Um, and you can see that in the chat box. Um, but quite interestingly, when I came to the conference in New York in 2016, I went to a session about unions and co-ops. And there was a French um, union leader there. And there was somebody from Seattle. And the French union leader said, unions have got one single purpose for their members, and that's to increase wages. Nothing else, mental health, well-being, participation, ownership, nothing. You know, just increasing wages. That's our single um, like obligation to our members. And then the, then the union from Seattle basically said that we support our union members to set up co-ops in Seattle. And coming from the kind of UK, European um, perspective on unions that was a really big surprise um, to find that US unions and I'm sure it's not universal it might be smaller unions more particular unions you know, unions with more radical history but yeah we've just got two or three minutes so I just wondered if yeah if you could speak to the question around unions at the moment and what the next you know couple of years well, might hold that background context of the condition is of workers makes a big difference in what the demand is of labor organizing, whether it's a union or some of the, the alternative labor organizing that we do. We don't have universalized health care. We don't have um, adequate public housing. We don't have, I mean, our environmental regulations are gone. So it's it should not be a land as a surprise that that the demand from the union members themselves is actually, it's not just about wages because you know, like our tax dollars aren't going toward public transit. They're not going toward housing. They're not going toward healthcare. They're not go like that. Uh, increasing our wages only means that post taxes, more of our own, uh, our take home pay is reduced because we have to shell out money for all these other things. You know, kids are having to go to private school because the public schools have been um, divested from, right? And so the unions and any kind of organizing in the US context um, ends up having to take on that cause. Um, I think it's also one of the reasons why, I mean, even though we have these four distinct councils, they're so overlapping. You can't separate our union co-ops council and that work from the immigrant council that we have or our policy and advocacy council, and certainly not from our racial and economic justice council. Like the history of workers in the United States comes all the way back to dispossession of indigenous people and of the land grabs um, of their land um, and genocide and black labor. And then some of the indentured uh, labor uh, particularly from um, Asian Pacific Islanders. We've got two more minutes. Do you want to step in, Kath? UK perspective. Um, yeah, I think I was just going to say that the, the union co-ops is that really a great example of how the kind of 
cross Atlantic inspiration has gone um, in that my understanding is that kind of it arose in the US from a collaboration with Mondragon and then kind of as it got more taken up over here people were like oh look what's going on over there um, and that's led to the to the recent issue of the manifesto uh, the Union Cult manifesto but it's really kind of quite heavily drawn from what's been going on in the States. And that's really exciting. I think um, it's a really, it, it, it's forging kind of new ground because the UK co-op movement is largely kind of political collectives based. That's its, that's its history. That's what most of the co-ops in it are like. And, and the ones that know each other and communicate are largely smaller collectives. So it's got a, a bit of a, sort of space to make within the movement and to kind of uh yeah um the our movement has to change its identity or grow its identity and you're right it's not a movement really <laughs> i'm gonna have to jump in there and wrap the session um but thank you so much to the panel for your time especially to the americans that have um, woken up earlier um to join us today um Next up, we've got the left and the limits of social media, which should be a really, really fascinating discussion about um, social media news and all the data and reports that came out of the last election in the UK. Um, we've also got a session tonight called Ownership in Crisis. Really excited that we've got Jessica gordon Nemhard, um, author of Collective Courage, which is a history of African-American cooperative thought and practice. And we've also got Yancey Strickler, who was the co-founder of Kickstarter, and via his idea space has been starting to write more about democratic ownership and the ownership crisis in the States. Um, so it'd be great if you could join us for that at seven o'clock. Um, yeah, for other sessions, if you just go back to the reception, you can see what's in the schedule and decide what to pick. But thanks again to everyone um, for all the questions on the chat box. Thanks to the panel again. Um, the, the next event will be December um, and we will share information about that in the near future. Okay, take care. Bye.